Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Roy and I am Rockland Community College's Chief Diversity Officer. My gender pronouns are she and her. Welcome to a book talk with Dr. Roger W. Davis. We are thrilled to have more than 100 people register for this event, including Rockland Community College employees, students and retirees, members of our college community, uh, representatives from SUNY administration and our sister campuses, and the Community College of Beaver County constituents. Thank you for joining us for what I know will be an informative, engaging, and fun presentation. Before we continue, I want to share a few guidelines that will allow us all to enjoy today's presentation. Please remain muted until asked to speak. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. But if you have any questions during the presentation, we encourage you to use the chat function. We are recording today's presentation and we'll post it on our diversity, equity, and inclusion website. Now I'm happy to turn the program over to Dr. Michael Bastin, president of Rockland Community College, who will introduce our featured speaker for today, Dr. Bastin. Hello, everybody. We're so glad to have you for this awesome book talk. This is an exciting time at our college because we continue to bring some of the best people in the country who are going to meet our needs and help us grow. So happy also today to have with us some very special guests. Our President Emeritus Dr. Cliff Wood and his wonderful wife Waylene will be with us today. Our trustee Emeritus Dr. Arlene Klingscale is with us today. One of our wonderful retirees, Elaine Padilla is with us today. Our trustee, Mary Lou Dillon, is with us today. And of course, as well, uh, Dr. Francis Pratt, one of our premier alums. It is such a wonderful time to share with an extraordinary author who's going to talk with us today. Dr. Roger Davis is the president of the Community College of Beaver County in Manaka, Pennsylvania. Dr. Davis is the first African-American to serve in that role. Before, of course, joining CCBC, he served as the Associate Vice President of Instruction and Academic Services at Rockland Community College. He is a dynamic leader. He is a wonderful author. He is a great friend. And so now we have this wonderful connection between Rockland Community College and the Community College of Beaver County, your cousins now. And so I'm happy to present my friend and brother. We together are working on a national collaboration of black male CEOs and community colleges. And he's one of those who are part of this great organization. He is so powerful, so prolific, and we are profoundly grateful to have him to be with us today, Dr. Roger Davis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, my name is Dr. Roger W. Davis and my pronouns are he and his. And I'm excited to uh, see so many of you. I've already in advance been trying to say hello, hello, hello very quickly on chat uh, to many of you. Uh, and I'm excited to bring you greetings uh, from Beaver County, Pennsylvania, which is the uh, most Western county, one of the most Western counties in uh, Pennsylvania. On the Ohio line, it is a town of bridges and rivers, as you can see from this beautiful picture. Many people think for some reason that Beaver County is just uh, an hour or two from Philadelphia. It is really six hours across the state. So we're on the total opposite part of Pennsylvania and I bring you uh, greetings from the county. I wanna celebrate with you African American History Month, uh, also Black History Month. And I want to start by just um, giving some shout outs to some of our Black history makers in Rockland County. I want to start with Dr. Bastian, who is the first African American president of Rockland Community College. He is a history maker. I want to start, go on with Dr. Arlene Klinkscale, who she is the first female superintendent, African American superintendent for the state of New York. She is a history maker. I want to give credit to Dr. Francis Hat Pratt who uh, served as the president of the NIAC NAACP for over 40 years, one of the longest running NAACP directors in the nation. She is a history maker. And then I do wanna give greetings to Dr. Wood and to his lovely wife, Wileen Wood. And for many of you, if you do not know, uh, Wileen Wood, his wife, is civil rights royalty. 
And you should go and read about her father, Wiley Austin Branton, so you can understand why she also is a history maker. Good afternoon. I'd like to start and say each of you needs a piece of paper. You know I am a, a, a instructor teacher at heart. So you should have a piece of paper to write on or some type of a notebook or something, but I need you to be able to take down because we have questions I'm going to be presenting to you that you're going to write uh, and answer throughout this presentation. And once you have your paper, I want you to number your paper one through seven, one through seven. Okay, so you have a piece of paper or a notebook or something to write on and I want you to number it one through seven. I'm just going to give you 10 seconds to do that so you're ready. They always say uh, when, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. All right, and we're ready to go. So the 30, 30 most powerful words in English language, many people thought that this was a pandemic project. It was not. Uh, I have been working on this project for a very, very, very long time. The project started with this uh, slide. So the first um, word that I ever wrote in this book was the final word, which is called life. And I wrote life, and I'll never forget, I faxed life over to my friend, Mache, who worked in the uh, district attorney's office in Baltimore City. And I called her a few hours later and I said, Mache, did you get life? Did you get life? Because she's one of the people she gives me, we exchange writings and, you know, we edit each other's work. And she said, no, no, I didn't get it. And I said, well, I faxed it like two, three hours ago. And she said, well, can you fax it again? And so I, I faxed it again, and then I called her back. I said, did you get it this time? She said, I did, but I also found out what happened the first time. Someone had gone to the fax machine and pulled it off, read it, made copies, and passed it out to the entire office. And so at that point, I knew I was on to something uh, with this book. And so this book started like this. It started with a floppy disk. And then it moved to this. And then it moved to this. And finally, in the last year, it finally got to this. And so this is a 25 year journey uh, of writing that I pulled together finally in a book. And I'm very excited to be with you here this afternoon to share just some of it today with you and I hope you'll enjoy. So let's go to question number one on your paper. Question number one. And I want you to take a deep breath and think of this. Over the last 11 months, I want you to think of a time that you did something fun, unique, or out of the box. And then I want you to write down what that was, right? And that's the 11 months of being in COVID-19, right? I know all of us have done something unique, fun, or out of the box since we've been there. Write down that, that event or project. And then I want you to write one word to describe how you felt about that event or experience. So over the last 11 months, I want you to think, you did something unique, you did something out of the box, something fun, something different, right? And then I want you to write down that event. And then I want you to write down the one word, just one word that describes how you felt about that event or experience. When you have that one word, I want you to circle it. I want you to put a big circle around that one word. And we should be ready. And we're going to go to question number two. Question number two says, think about how other people see you. Think about how other people see you. And then think of the one word you would hope they would say to describe you. So think about how other people see you. And then think of the one word you would hope they would use to describe you. I want you to write that one word down for number two. And then I want you to circle that word, circle that word that you've come up with. So you'll have, you'll have two words on your paper now and they both should be circled, okay? You should have two circles on your paper. We're now gonna to go to an online poll and Rockland's gonna launch this online poll at this time that I want you to take. You'll be able to answer it right on the screen. I want, you, I want you to answer this. Do you have a project or initiative or idea that you've been working on and have not completed for at least two years or longer and you still want to complete it? Yes or no? And we'll give you just about 10 more seconds to answer that. You just click right on yes or no right on the screen and hit submit. 
And I'm even going to, I don't know, can I answer it? Let me see. I think I can answer it too. Yes. All right. I, so let's see the results of that. Oh my, 85% of us have something that has been dragging for a little while for us, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is one of the outcomes today, I'm going to give you uh, four strategies. I'm gonna give you four strategies and how I believe you, how you can implement this to get these projects, ideas, or whatever it is done on, 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 your, on your watch, all right? We're gonna start with uh, strategy number one. Strategy number one is an accountability partner or partners. This is the strategy I use to complete uh, my book. I had two of my friends become my accountability partners. And the attributes that your accountability partner or partners need, they need to be able to nag you to death, right? Someone that can nag you to death. Someone that's going to check in with you, that's reliable, but someone that's clearly going to tell you the truth about you're not pulling your weight but they're also gonna be a cheerleader. And so many of you have people in your life that you can assign to be your accountability partner and that can hold you accountable for this project, idea, or initiative that you're trying to complete. So that's one. Number two is I believe, and I have this also, you'll be very shocked, I have my own board of directors, okay? And I have a board of directors and you'll be shocked, they're on Facebook. I have a Facebook group, a private Facebook group that are my board of directors. And when I really want to make a decision or I think a decision is tough and I really need their advice, I go into my Facebook group and I tell them this is what I am dealing with and they write back their sage advice. They help me with the decisions. They tell me the truth, but my board of directors, I only have chosen people that I know want the best for me. We all have friends, but every friend does not want the best for you. And so my, my second suggestion is assign yourself a board of directors that you can go to when you, when you need them to help push you forward. The third item is, look at this uh, picture. I love this picture and I, I do this and it's called a reminder system. It's a reminder system that you're gonna nag your own self. And so uh, I turned my phone off so it didn't vibrate, but even on my phone, when I turn my phone on every day, it has my goals on my a screensaver. And the goals that I've created are not for the year. I have decade goals, 10 year goals that I'm trying to accomplish. So anytime I have to work with this phone, the goals are nagging me. Look, I'm going, oh, I didn't start that. And so I truly believe you should do a reminder system, right? So you're putting stickies all over the place, stickies in your car, stickies in the refrigerator, stickies uh, in, the, in the bathroom, on, on the mirror, because there, it's reminding you to do a little every day because we know that little by little makes much. And then the final one, this is a strategy that I use this weekend myself, is a reward system. And so I love Mission Barbecue, okay? And um, I told myself a reward system treats you just like a parent. You tell yourself, well, you cannot go outside until you do your homework. And so I told myself this weekend, I could not leave my house until I finished this PowerPoint presentation. But if I finished the PowerPoint presentation, I would treat myself to Mission Barbecue. And so you do know I treated myself to Mission Barbecue, I finished the PowerPoint. But it's a psychological trick that we, we go back to childhood with our parents. And again, it is little by little makes much. And so I've just given you four strategies to complete a project, which includes an accountability partner. It includes a reminder system, your own board of directors, and a reward system. Let's move to question number three. Question number three. I want you to take a moment and just think of your childhood. Just think of your childhood. And what one memory sticks out in your head? Write one word to describe that event. So think of your childhood and just the first event that pops out from your childhood and what one word you would use to describe that event. And then what do we always do after we have that word? We're gonna circle that word, right? We're gonna circle that word. We're gonna circle that word, okay? So you have your three circles and we have our three questions and I'm going to pause now and I'm going to read from the book, Commitment because I've just talked about, right, strategies in which you can finish things. So it always uh, revolves around commitment. 
Commitment on page 47, it says, unless commitment is made, there are only promises and hopes, but no plans. And that's by Peter F. Drucker. A commitment is like a stamp. You need to stick to it until you get somewhere. Geniuses are merely people who commit to something for a lifetime without looking for rewards, praise, or acknowledgement. They just keep working at it until someone says, wow. And even then, many of these geniuses don't want to hear your comments. They simply go back to their genius residency. So let's talk about spiritual commitments. I will start the morning off without confusion, noise, and chaos. I will meditate at least one minute in the morning before I leave the house, getting in tune with myself, my energies, my God. I will pray to the one who knows me best. I will read at least one scripture a day. I will reflect on my day and be courageous enough to admit the problems of the day that I caused. Physical commitments. I will begin a diet that is healthy, fat reduced, fiber increased, fruit, vegetable, and water laden. I will take the steps at least twice a week instead of taking the elevator. I will find a workout partner to keep each other motivated. Ask your doctor if you are the ideal weight and work on becoming that. Take care of your skin, invest in a pedicure, exercise vigorously weekly, walk moderately daily, and sleep deeply nightly. Mm, yes. Emotional commitments. Start making a commitment to build, nurture, and sustain familial relationships. Forgive those who have hurt you. Forgive yourself for those who you have hurt. Be aware of your emotions. Your emotions should not dictate how your day goes, how you respond to colleagues, and how you feel. If your emotions control you, instead of you controlling your emotions, then you should consider seeing a professional. You are the master of your moods, emotions, and desires. Stop laughing when things aren't funny and crying when things aren't sad. And financial commitments. Commit to be as debt-free as possible. Commit to placing aside 10% of your salary. Even if you can't afford to put in aside 10%, start with 5%, start with 2%, but start. Then keep increasing that amount that you put aside. Make a financial commitment to give consistently to a charity or program. And at least once a year, cash your paycheck. I mean, look at the money and then deposit it again. Look at your worth in real cash. And if you are not satisfied with what you see, commit to improvement. If you want to see an aspect of your life improve, commit. That's commitment from page 47. We're going to go to question number four. Question number four. What is your greatest achievement thus far? And then I want you to write down what it was. What was your greatest achievement thus far? Write down what it was. And then I want you to write down one word to describe that achievement. Just one word to describe that achievement. So what was your greatest achievement thus far that you, you could think of in your life? Write it down and then write the one word to describe that achievement. And as always, what do we do? We're going to circle the word, right? We're going to circle the word. We're going to circle the word. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to go now to Miracle on page 30. I'm just going to read the quote, and I'm going to tell you the story by heart. I'm not going to read it. Um, so Miracle, I love this. I am realistic. I expect miracles. I know that's right. I, I expect miracles every day. I graduated from uh, Morgan State University with my doctoral degree, and uh, I'll never forget, I was blessed to be able to work at that institution the last two years I was working on my doctorate. And my dissertation advisor was uh, just one floor above me, uh, Dr. Ola Raggin Smith. And she um, always allowed me, I would go upstairs, I'm supposed to be working, right? I'm supposed to be working, but I wouldn't. I would go upstairs and I would go say, well, this chapter, you know, about the variables, I'm stuck here. And she would help me and everything. And so I, it was time, the way Morgan sets up there, um, doctoral one, they have an introductory meeting where you present your uh, research they approve. You have a final meeting where you present your re results and then you have an oral defense. 
And at the oral defense, you have to pass the oral defense, right, to be able to get the final degree, okay? And so uh, the dean of the graduate school, the, the, the day before um, my final meeting, took my dissertation of 150 pages and faxed it to five of his friends. And he called Dr. Smith and I to his office to discuss the findings from his five friends on my dissertation and his dislike of, of what he uh, saw from his friends and his issues with the, with the um, document. And so we're going to his office at nine o'clock in the morning. And before I walked in, Dr. Smith looked at me and says, you do not argue with this man. You let the authorities argue for you. And she said, what, what she meant by that was when he brings up an issue, you say, well, according to Natchmias and Natchmias on page 82, it indicates that uh, quantitative variables are highlighted such and such. According to Kate Tarabian, a footnote as it relates to internet sourcing says such and such and such. She said, that's what we're going to do in this meeting. And so we're in this meeting and this meeting is going on and on and on. He is literally going through this dissertation page by page and bringing out issues. And she and I are going with him, you know, we're going toe to toe with him. And uh, this is a, um, a faculty member, a chair of a department who had been at the institution for over 30 some years. At one point she wrote the self-study by herself, right? So she is as sophisticated as you get at the institution. And he, at one point, he says to her, well, you know, the hell with both of you. And at that point, Dr. Iola Ragan smith said, I've been here 30 years. I've seen deans come and I've seen them go. And you are not going to talk to me that way. And she walked out the door. And I'm like, oh, okay, now it's just me and the dean. <laughs> I'm looking like, what happened to Dr. Smith? So it's just the dean and I sitting here. And he continues to go through this document. And then all of a sudden, it's now about 11.30, it's 11.45, it's 12.30 and the phone rings. He takes the phone call, he gets off the phone. He goes on for another 20 minutes and I'm still holding my own. I'm holding my own with this man, right? And then he says, well, you know what? It's 10 of one and your colloquium is scheduled at one o'clock. So I don't know what you're gonna do if you can get this committee together, but they need to be here at one o'clock. And so I go, I run across campus. I go to Dr. Ola Smith's office. She is there eating her lunch and watching soap operas because back in the day they had TVs in her office, right? She watched her soap operas. I go and get Dr. Marlene Greer Chase, my other member. And then I look for my third member, Dr. Haynes, and he is nowhere to be found. And so they come over to the conference room in the graduate school and it's one o'clock and, no, and there's no Dr. Haynes. And his secretary is trying to reach him because he took a late lunch. It's 1.05, there's no Dr. Haynes. It's 1.10, there's no Dr. Haynes. It's 1.15 and I excuse myself and I go into the bathroom because a miracle is defined as timeliness, okay? R Renita Weems is a biblical scholar and she talks about, oh yeah, we could talk about God all day long and movement, but at the end of the day, it has to show up on time for it to be defined as a miracle. And so I come back from the bathroom where I prayed. I was like, God, I need you to manipulate time. I need help here, you know, at this moment. I come back in the office and the dean comes in and says, well, we're going to have to reschedule. Now, you have to remember, it is Thursday. Commencement is Saturday. You can only come back one day for the oral defense on Friday, right? So I only, I, this is my only day to be able to make it to commencement. And the secretary walks in as he's talking to us and says, oh, Dr. Haynes called, he's on his way. So I just, just unbelievable. So I put my head down and I just said, okay. So Dr. Haynes comes in, we go through the colloquium. We go through the colloquium, I go through everything. They ask me to leave the room. I go and sit in the lobby of the graduate school and the secretary for the graduate school starts to talk to me about, she experienced a miracle because she had no money to pay her heating bill. And all of a sudden a check out of nowhere came to her. And I said, that is a miracle. That's amazing. And you know, we just sat there and talked about that. The door opens and Dr. Smith comes out and she gives me the thumbs up. She thumbs up. And I'm thinking to myself, oh great. That means, you know, I'll, I have to go home and spend an all nighter and then come the next day to do the oral defense. So I go in the room and Dr. Smith remains standing. And then Dr. Marlene Greer Chase stands up and then Dr. Haynes stands up and they say to me, congratulations, Dr. Davis. And I became the first student in the history of Morgan State to never have an oral defense. And that was a miracle. That was a miracle. Let's go to question 
number five. So if someone gave you $10 million tomorrow and you could not spend it on yourself, who would you spend it on? If someone gave you $10 million tomorrow and you could not spend it on yourself, who would you spend it on? And I want you to list one word to describe that person. Just one word to describe that person. One word to describe that person. Someone gave you $10 million, but you can't spend it on yourself, but you can spend it on someone else. Who is the one person? And I want you to use one word to describe that person. Some people are controlled by others. Some people are controlled by no one, but all of us are controlled by time. There was a little clock that sat on a shelf and the little clock had to tick and talk and tick and talk and tick and talk 31,536,000 times a year. It had to tick and talk and tick and talk and tick and talk. And finally it said, look, I can't do this. I can't tick and talk and tick and talk 31,536,000 times a year. But then the grandfather clock came over to the little clock and he said, little clock, you don't have to worry about a tick and a talk and a tick and a talk and a tick and a talk. All you've got to do little clock is tick and then talk and tick and talk and tick and talk. But you've got to make sure that each tick and each talk counts. Time makes all of us equal, no matter how rich, how beautiful, tall, short, or thin we are. We have been equally distributed time. Each year, each of us has 31,536,000 seconds, and it's up to us to use it wisely or waste it foolishly. Let us live each day as if the end of the day was our last. In essence, it is. We have lost those valuable seconds. Have we made them count? or have we just counted them? The greatest predictor of your potential is how you spend your time. Do you spend it studying, networking, and developing, or do you spend it couching, gossiping, and procrastinating? None of us can say that we were treated unfairly by time. Time is the fairest of all equal opportunities. That was time on page 71. Let's go to question number six. Question number six. I love this one. And this is what I think one of the toughest uh, questions to tell you the truth. When you catch yourself daydreaming, what is it about? And write one word to describe your daydreams. When you catch yourself daydreaming, hmm, what is it about? and write one word to describe your daydreams. Give you a second. And remember, you're supposed to circle your word. When you get that one word, yeah. So if I didn't say it before, circle the one word that you always have. All right, we're gonna go to freedom now on page 82. And I, I, this is one I love. It says freedom. Uh, the willingness to sacrifice is the prelude to freedom. But the first sentence says, purchase it, seize it, plead for it, wait for it, whatever you do, get to freedom. And so in the movie Beloved, I don't know if many of you have seen Beloved by, um, written by Toni Morrison, but it was executive produced and it was starring Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah Winfrey plays Setha, the main character in uh, Beloved. And there's a scene there where uh, the premise of the movie for many of you is that Setha was a slave and her children and she killed her children instead of having them remain enslaved. And so at one point she escapes to freedom. And, and the, it's interesting because the scene talks about 28 days. And it's interesting, I just realized that it's on 82, which is the reverse of 28. <laughs> so it says 28 days. And she, she keeps talking about her being free for the 28 days. But in the scene, she has flashbacks of master coming. She has flashbacks of being back on the plantation. She has flashbacks, right, of running away because in theory, she was never free. And so freedom reads thusly. Very few of us are free, including myself. Someone owns us if we are always looking over our shoulder because of debts, 
desires, disasters, and dismay. Richard N. Dixon, a prominent African-American and past treasurer of the state of Maryland, indicated in a speech where I was at that he was a free man. He was an elected official, wealthy, and had the ability to retire tomorrow and live a very comfortable life. Freedom lies in what actually is your possession. That's why I like and encourage education. And we're all pretty much educators on this call, most of us. No one can take it from you. They can foreclose on my house, they can repossess my car, they can auction my belongings, but they cannot take my degrees. I may be homeless, I may be broke, I may be walking, but I'm still an educated man. It saddens and shocks me to go to the tax sale each year and see homes that have been completely paid off auction for a few thousand dollars in back taxes. You must begin to live your life in a manner that requires you to free yourself. Diminish credit, live within your, our means, terminate dead relationships, fire negative friends, work at a place that you love and live a life that is nourishing. Stop looking over your shoulder. If you are doing this, you know that the master will eventually come and get you. Whether the master is debt, a skeleton in your closet or a lie on the resume, the master will come. Take the steps necessary to be a free person. No matter how you obtain it, freedom must be your end result. Let us understand that freedom is a lonely place. What are you willing to lose, sacrifice, or take on in order to be free? This is the critical question you must ask yourself each day you stay enslaved. What is this sacrifice? Specifically, what is it for you? That was freedom on page 82. And, and Melissa, I'm moving quickly, Melissa. So I'm on the final question, which is question number seven. And I, I love this one. I wrote this one myself. I love this one. It is, it, the year is 2080 and you passed away the day before. Some of you laugh, but I've, I've given you a lot more years to live, okay? And you passed away the day before. Now, we have new national burial rules that indicate that you can no longer put your year of birth or death on your tombstone. The only thing that you can put on your tombstone is your name and one word. What is the one word that you would put on your tombstone? So it's 2080, 60 years from the day, okay? I'll be 111. <laughs> and the burial rules have changed, right? There no longer can you put a lot of things on the tombstone. You can't put the year you're born, the year you die. All you can put is your name and one word. What would that one word be? And then I want you to circle that. And so you should have at this moment, you should have seven circles on your paper, seven circles on your paper from the seven questions. Even if you don't, even if you came late and you didn't get to the, the seven circles, it's all right. You, whatever you have, you have, okay? We're now going to create a power word. You're going to create your own power word, okay? So here's what you're going to do. I want you now to just, it's, it's three methods that you can choose from. The first method is this, look at the seven words or look at the seven circles that you have on your paper. Is there any one word that jumps out at you? Just one word that jumps out at you, right? You've either, it keeps, you see it all the time, you know, you just bought a book with the same word in it. It's just something about that word that jumps out at you, right? If that, if you, if that is one of the methods you use, I want you to put a square around that word because that's going to be your power word. OK, if there's just one word that jumps out at you and said, I just love this word, that's going to be your power word. The second method is I want you to look at the seven words. And is there any word among the seven word that summarizes all of the other words? Is there any word among the seven that summarizes all of the other words? If there is one, then that is your power word. You'll put a square around that one. That would be your power word. And the third one is that you're going to look at all seven words and then create one word that's, that's a theme for all seven. What one word is a theme for all seven? What one word is a theme for all seven? So you have three of the strategies, but you have to pick one of the strategies. The first one is a word jumps out at you, just jumps out at you. You're so excited, like, yeah, that's my word. I know that's my word. 
The second one is there's a word among the seven that summarizes all seven, or you're going to create a word that is a theme for all seven of the words. Those are your three options. And I'll give you just 10 more, 10 to 20 more seconds to do that. Now we're going to do something called a word cloud. So you should have your word, your power word, your power word, which we just done out the three strategy, one, three, you should have your power word. I am going to put in the chat to everyone the link. And then on the screen, you can also do this. You can just take your phone, turn on your camera, and, and let your camera look at the QR code, which is that funny looking uh, shape. And it will then on your camera, it should say tap something, right? It should say tap something. So you'll tap it and that's where you're gonna put your power word. If not, if you don't have a phone or you can't do that, then just click on the link and the link will say put in your power word and then you'll hit submit. And then uh, uh, Colt is helping me here. He's going to uh, show us what our word cloud will look like. We'll give him a second. Here you go. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. And this is happening live as you put your words in. And what we'll do, we will send this word cloud to uh, Rockland Community College. And so the president and, and uh, Ms. Roy can share this with, with all the participants on the call. This is, this is great. Love is still winning. I love that. <laughs> love is still winning. And Cole, I think we can keep that up. I'm going to read the final um, passage, which I want everyone to hear. This is one of my favorite ones. And uh, it's on page 24, if I can get to it now. And this is to all of you as we keep watching. I want you just to just, if you just close your eyes, if you can, and just listen to this. And this is for each of you for the last 11th month through this COVID-19 pandemic. We are survivors. We are still alive. We are still thriving. We are blessed, many of us, to be employed and not have suffered as much through this. And I am just grateful to be here today with you. Um, and this is called sufficiency. Everything that you will ever need lies within. That's from Susan L. Taylor. And this is to each of you. I'm reading it as if you are reading this. I am sufficient. I am enough. I have what it takes. I am competent, capable, and courageous enough to improve and impact the quality of life of my friends, colleagues, family, and spouse. I am sufficient. God pulled together atoms and molecules, proteins, people, nutrients in 280 days, give or take, to get me here. I am sufficient. Although mom or dad, boss or subordinate, sibling or friend may have said that I am not capable, underqualified, overqualified, too old or too young, I am sufficient. Everything I need to be who I am, I have within me. I am enough for a little child who needs a hug. I am enough for a charity that needs a hand. I am enough for a community that needs help. I am enough for that single mother who needs some hope. I am enough for that senior citizen who needs some happiness. I am sufficient. I am capable of making contributions, big or small, that can make a difference. I am a sufficient human being, qualified, talented, and able. There are many millionaires and billionaires who are not sufficient. They help very few people, give to very less, and hide from so many. They live lives that destroy rather than ones that build people and their dreams. Sufficient people put their resources, time, talent, and money into people, their dreams, and their future, and not into corporations, companies, and stocks. I am sufficient. I am worthy of someone to love me passionately, respectfully, and thoroughly. I am sufficient. Thoughts of doubt, despair, and doom are lies told to me by people, circumstances, and past experiences. I am sufficient. 
And although I may not have received the promotion or raise, sustained a great marriage, or raised a successful family, I am still enough. I am sufficient. I am sufficient because time allows me to try again. I can correct those things that I have blundered, apologize to those I have hurt, untie the knots that I have made, get off at the next exit for the one that went by, take another shot for the one that I missed, and exit and reboot the system that has stalled or crashed. I have time, chances, and resources at my disposal. Don't tell me what I'm not. Tell me what I am. I am sufficient. So that was, that was one of my favorite words on page 24. Uh, and so that's sufficiency. That's to each of you that joined us today. Thank you so much. Uh, I am on Instagram at 30 most powerful words on Instagram. If you follow, follow me on the gram, I'm doing something every day and some inspirational thing. I believe my life has been one of an encourager. I am a person that encourages people to live their best life, to keep on keeping on, to put one foot in front of the other. I just truly believe that has been one of my callings in life. And you also can reach me at my email, which is 30 most powerful words at Gmail. And I'm asking for just a favor from the participants participants on this call. If you get the book, I would love for you to just take a selfie and send a selfie to me on the 30 uh, most powerful words at gmail.com. That would be a blessing to me as I can keep using those visuals to show other people. And as I always, always, always say, thank you so much. And the best is yet to come. Thank you, Roger. So I have to tell you, you really ended on a word that I love. Sufficient was one of my favorites as well. I wanna open up the, um, the time for some questions and answers and I'm gonna take the privilege of asking the first one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so while I loved Sufficient, mm -hmm. um, I, as I was reading the book and I arrived at the word seven, yeah. I get to the end of it and it tells me to refer to death but i couldn't find death yes so why is that roger okay so um i'm gonna touch you death was in the book and death didn't make it to the final and uh i had three editors and the three editors i talked about it and uh it did not make it to the final cut and we realized uh together i realized i think with them that death is not a power word right when it is finished it is finished and in fact, death is not written by me. Death is written by another author. I get it. It makes sense. <laughs> I, as much as I want to keep asking you questions, I want to open it up and allow others to ask any questions that they might have. So you can raise your hand in Zoom or you can come off mute and start talking. And while we're waiting, I want to also just give a shout out to a miracle worker, and that is Dr. Shamika Mitchell, who uh, I don't know if you followed her, but she did a foster parent for two beautiful babies for a month or two. And that was a miracle, Dr. Mitchell, and I just want to honor you for that, especially as a, a person who was uh, in foster care. So I see Sonny Reyes has his hand raised. So Sonny. Come off mute and Sonny, if you look behind me, your picture is behind me somewhere. <laughs> There's a picture of your <laughs> oh. So good to see you, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, my favorite word is grace. Uh, so mm. much so that I, middle name of, uh, it's, it's Vivian's middle name. Oh, daughter. Vivian, okay. A um, couple of things. One, in covenant. Um, mm -hmm. You were asked to write something. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that didn't come from the book of Samuel. Is that what you wrote in the italics? Is that you? Let me see. Wait a minute. So you make me go to stuff. <laughs> go to oh, I'm going to make you work, too. I got another one, too, for you. <laughs> OK, OK. OK, hold on. 47. See, I got to go to my own table of contents. Oh, no. Did I miss it? Oh, no. See, that's why I don't. I should wear my glasses, Sonny. You always tell me, and I don't wear mm -hmm, 88. I'm on 88. Yes, that is from the book of Samuel. Yes, it is. 
It's from First oh, Samuel. Oh, and it, couple, it is. It is from the Bible. This is uh, for um, a couple in Atlanta. I wrote this for um, a same gender loving couple that was getting uh, married, and I wrote that for them. Yeah. So. Okay, okay. So you wrote you wrote this in the Italian. I wrote yes, yes. I wrote that. Yeah, not the Bible. Beautiful. I wrote everything else. Yes. Beautiful. Um, last thing. Um, I see you quoted Dr. Martin Luther King, Confucius, yeah. Steve Jobs. And then there's Mr. Greenberg, fourth grade class. Yes. Can you explain that? <laughs> I just found that on the internet. I thought it was cute. So I just used it. I thought it was on the internet. I tried to get back, you know, uh, cited correctly, but I did find it on the internet. So I love that. So. Thank you. Nice seeing you, Sunny. Oh. Thank you, Sunny. And so I'm going to call on Elaine Padilla. Oh, Dr. Padilla. How are you, Roger? This was awesome. such a wonderful presentation. I'm so proud of you. Oh, thank you, Lily. And I loved the book. Oh. I loved the book. Every single word in the book said so much more than was on the printed page. Thank you. And now that you've done this, and I think it's going to be a smashing success, I'm waiting for your second book. Oh. And I'm hoping that your second book because you're so sensitive mm -hmm. to people and feelings mm -hmm. and culture and diversity, I'm hoping your second book will identify words that we don't yet have in the English language. Ooh. And- That's the sociologist in you all day long. <laughs> I know that, I can't help it. I just yeah. can't help it, it's uh -huh. in my DNA. Uh -huh. One of the things that occurred to me in was a tragedy in my own life. Mm -hmm. And that is when you lose a spouse, you can be a widow or a widower. Mm. And I'm particularly sensitive to this because as an anthropologist, when I lived in Kenya, when people greet each other, they don't say hello. They mm. say, how are the children? Oh. Because children are such an important part of our lives and our legacy. But in my own life, when my son passed away, mm -hmm. there was no word in the English language yes. to describe my status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I think about some of the travails and the challenges that all of us face in some of these troubling times, Raja, I want you to coin some of that terminology okay. for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. We need it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. You, that's a great challenge. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. And I want to I want to acknowledge also behind me, and I'm going to get choked up. I'm going to get choked up. Um, the, my chief of staff is over here working, and he gives so much. And his son, Andrew, is fighting cancer. He's five years old. And he came, He Andrew had to go to the hospital on Tuesday, and he is here by my side helping me right now. And so I, I know what you mean by that, and I love you to death, Colt, for everything that you do for me and our institution, and thank you. So. Thank you, Elaine, for joining us from Florida. Much appreciated. So now I'm going to uh, call on Cliff and Wileen Wood, who are oh. joining us from Vermont. Oh, such an honor. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. We are technologically <laughs> challenged here in Vermont. <laughs> but it's so good to see you. And we love the book as well. We were trying to take your selfie, but we're going to have to get our neighbor to help us do a selfie. Okay. But we will get you one, I promise. Okay. okay. And the other thing I would say to you, you're blessed to be employed. I'm very blessed to be unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And, you know, uh, my, I, Wiley and I both didn't tell each other about it. We both ended up with the same word, which was love. Oh, and, you. Uh, you know, we just love our life here in Vermont. We miss our children, but we talk to them and see them on something called Duo yes. all the time. And are now six grandchildren. And we have great neighbors. And I just am, you know, the luckiest person in the world to have had the, the, the because I loved what I did. Yes. 50 years I did it. And but I'm going to love these next ever how many years as well, because yeah. um, we we just have been very blessed. And so we lo I love your positive. I've always loved your positive attitude. We're just while I'll let her speak for herself. 
I am very proud of you, Roger. Oh, thank I'm you. sure you're a great president, and I'm sure your faculty and staff really respond to you because you just have that kind of a giving spirit. So thank you. Oh. Congratulations on a job well done. Thank you. And Roger, I'll just say that uh, I love the book too. It is so approachable. And, you know, sometimes people write um, self improvement sort of books, uh, but, you know, you, you can't really get the feel of it. But this is you through and through. Oh, thank you. Positive, inspiring, mm -hmm. courageous, mm -hmm. and so instructive. Yeah. And, and I, I appreciate this opportunity to tell you that yeah. and to read your book and to see you doing so well in so many ways. And thank you for sharing with the rest yeah. of us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Bastian, I have to tease uh, Dr. Bastian. When Dr. Wood announced he was retiring, I left. And, 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 and what, I didn't want to leave, but I left. The moment he said he was leaving, I left. You know, <laughs> and, and that just was it. I just, I did. I've been someplace where a new president came, and I just, I didn't want to go through that. It's not about you, Doctor Bastin. But I get I, you, brother. These are his are huge shoes to fill. I've been doing my very best trying to hold on. Oh. But it's so beautiful to see you, Doctor Wood, and your lovely mm -hmm. wife. Yeah, and this. This is such a beautiful moment for all of us. And I'm just so grateful to see you all. You all are looking phenomenal. Yes, and, they are. They look great. And, and Roger, so you the one that brings the whole family together. Oh, I yeah. love it. <laughs> oh, another question for you, Roger. So you didn't include doctor yes. with your name on the book. So many you talked about, you know, a, a, a miracle in terms mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. achieving that honor. So why not? So I think um, Mrs. Wood just said it. I wanted the book to be um, uh, approachable. And what you're sometimes finding in um, this past environment, especially under the Trump administration, you know, higher ed had been under attack. Um, uh, the Trump administration had had made higher education, it moved to this anti-education model, right? And I believe, I still believe I'm just this average person. You can take me to Ruth Chris Steakhouse or we can eat peanut butter and jelly at your house. I, I don't care, right? I'm not that, that type of person. And so I didn't use the title on purpose because I wanted, if you did not see me as an average person, I wanted the average person to just pick up this book. So that's why. The license and um, ask my own question. I want to um, next bring uh, Penny Jennings has a question. You're on mute, Penny. Oh, you're still on mute, Penny. Uh oh, she made the type it. <laughs> Hello. There it is. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Congratulations, Dr. Davis. I think the book is very inspirational. And I tell you this, I have a abundance, you know, my background. I work with at-risk youth and populations. I'm going to order this book for an ab a bunch of my, my uh, participants in my programs. I think it's very inspirational. And I, I love it. You know, I'm a person that agrees with the words are very powerful. Oh, you. So you and I are like-minded in that, and yeah. all the best, best wishes. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Jennings. Thank you so Good much. To see you. you Note in the chat that someone asked, when will the t-shirts for the word sufficient oh. start? Okay, okay. <laughs> that, that's another challenge. I'll write it down. Okay. okay. <laughs> Very good. Very good. I see Burton Lewis Charles has a question. Okay, Burton. Well, I really don't have a question. So, Roger, I'm just going to tell you up, up front, Dr. Davis, I'm so proud of you. Every time you do bigger and better things. And I just want to tell you that, one, we got the book. I am I just started reading it. You know, I'm reading it after my wife, so we're taking turns. <laughs> but I just wanted to tell you, you've been an inspiration ever since I've known you. Oh. And even after you left RCC, you always helped me and my wife out. You guided us in the right direction. And I wanted to thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bert. And I love you. Love you too, Bert. No. Oh. Um, Patty Maloney Titlin. Oh, hey, Patty. 
Hello, Dr. Davis. Hey, and Patty, hello, how are you? Wiley, Dr. Wood, Elaine, Dr. Bastin, and colleagues. Thank you, Melissa. I, Dr. Davis, I, uh, I read the book. Uh, it was inspirational. I don't really have a question except to ask you when you're going to turn it into a one act play because oh. I know how passionate and dramatic you are and yeah. I would look forward to to seeing that but it made me think of things mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about in a long time mm -hmm. and it made me think of many words um, you know that came to mind. I couldn't pick just one but I did settle on love as well mm -hmm. uh, but I, I just want to thank you. It's so wonderful to see you and you the too. book really um, took me in so many different directions and I thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Pat. Thank you for that great feedback. Thank you. <laughs> One more, Carmel Owens. Oh, my good friend. Carmel, you're still on mute. Okay, there you go. Just unmute it. Okay. Hello, Dr. Davis. I just wanted to bring you greetings while I'm on vacation in Virginia Beach. Um, I met you back in the early 2000s when we both worked at UMUC. And I just wanted to say that watching the trajectory of your career and the way you have excelled since that time has been amazing. I told you when I first met you, you were like, to me, you were like caffeine is to Starbucks. And this book, is going to do great work for many, many people. And I just want to say I'm so proud of you and thank you for all that you do for the education world and young people, especially. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you. So, Rogers, obviously, you are feeling the love because people are definitely showing it to you. Yeah. We really have enjoyed you joining us for today's uh, discussion. We love what you're doing. Um, we only imagine the best for you. I'll tell you that just like Dr. Jennings mentioned, uh, we do plan to purchase 50 books and we've asked for you to sign those books and we will make them available on a first come first serve basis to folks at Rockland Community College. We want to support you in everything that you do and we think the world of you, but we also imagine that this will be a book that will definitely be beneficial to our employees. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. I appreciate all of you for joining us today. It's been a fantastic an opportunity to engage with Dr. Davis and to see so many wonderful faces um, that I haven't seen in quite some time. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. If you have snow where you are, be safe. Thank you. All the all right. best, everyone. Stay safe.